Um, okay, so as Pamela mentioned, I work in geometric measure theory. So that's a branch of a mathematical analysis. And one can say like very loosely, one can say that it studies, what is it? It studies like the geometric properties of objects. So can, so can you think about the geometric property of an object that you like? I don't know, like what's the geometric property of my glass? You can answer, please. There are no wrong answers. This is, this is not, this is not going to be on the exam. It's a cylinder. Oh, exactly. Thank you. So that's its shape, right? So geometry, a possible geometric property of oh, that's its shape. And then I'm not sure, but like, and then it's like, I don't know, nine centimeter tall, right? For instance, so like, that's like a measurement of size. So they think like, I cannot see, this is too hard, sorry. Okay, I'm just gonna scan, I feel very weird, okay. Uh, okay, so like the, the two properties I'd like to talk to you about is shape and size, okay? So let's start with size. So if I ask you something like, so if I give you like, um, like a segment, right? A little, a little line. So you have imagined this thing. So I can ask you uh, how long it is, and then you will you will have some like unit of measure, whether it's feet, inches, centimeter, whatever you want, and you tell me it's long, three something. Very good. But now I could ask you like I could take something like this, right? So this like is a square. And let me know if everything I show is like not clear or too small. I can ask you to take something like this and I can ask you, what's the length of this? Like, would you think that's a good question to ask about this? No. Right, because what's the right question? The dimensions. The Shape. area, right? Shape. Yeah, the area, and that's, the, and, and that's the, the difference is that we perceive this as a one-dimensional object, while we, we perceive this as a two-dimensional object. So this one, we ask the length, and it would not make sense to ask what's the area. And this one, you ask the area, because it doesn't really make sense to ask for the length. Unless I'm talking, of course, of the length of the, of the perimeter. But I was talking about the whole thing. And again, like in real life, we can continue with like three-dimensional objects, right? I can ask you the volume of two-dimensional objects. And in mathematics, we have a um, pretty natural generalization to the concept of length, area, and volume to every integer dimension. So integer, I mean one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like that. Now there are like some examples. Okay, like there. Now there are some examples where like people ask, like what is the length of this thing? And so, okay. Another way to say something, which is like, how do I, how can, why do I, why can I tell, besides like that my eyes can see that this is two dimensional, how can I tell that that's the wrong thing? Like that's the wrong question to ask. And it, it's not gonna give me any like meaningful information about the object I'm trying to study. Well, for instance, if I, if I, one way that I could try to measure the length of, of this square, I'm trying to try to, um, this is a, okay, right? So I could just like pretend like do like line and count the, the, the length of this line and then continue the length of this line and then like, you know, until I fill it all in. Like I'm gonna count, though this is, this is long one, this is long one, this is. And if you do that mathematically, you find out that the length of the square is infinity, right? In the same way, if I try to measure the area of this, where I'm imagining that this is really infinitesimally thin, I will get that the, the area is zero, right? But this is clearly like, this is not, this is an object. So zero is not really telling me anything and infinity, and this is not something which is infinitely long. So this is really not telling me anything about it, right? So the point is that sometimes you can ask the wrong question about a thing. Now there are objects where you can ask how long they are and the answer you get will always be infinity. But then you ask, okay, so it's like, and, and then you're like, okay, but now that's probably the, the wrong question. Let me ask the next one. What's their area? And that's gonna be always zero. So what's happening? But it's not just exist. Well, in mathematics, they exist. So they don't, in real life, it's a bit more complicated. And uh, 
And so the, 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 the point is that what is the right question? And the picture that I drew here, oh my God, can you guys see? I can move it a little closer. Let me know. Okay, so I drew some example of this phenomenon, okay? So, and I drew, I drew them already, but then I wanted to like draw them for you on the spot, but I'm bad at drawing. So I, this one is like my, my insurance. So what is happening? I started with a triangle, right? Oh my God, I got, I, I'm a little stuck. Okay. I started with a triangle and now I take the middle third of each side, right? Oh, and let's say that like the, the, the side of the triangle is one, one, meter, foot, whatever you like, okay? Also, please, like if I say something which is not clear and it's like too technical, please interrupt me. Like, don't worry, it's, it's not rude. It's very much appreciated. Okay, so I'm gonna remove the middle. So I, I'm, I'm gonna chop this in things of the length, one third, one third, one third, and I'm gonna re re remove the middle one. And I'm gonna do the same on each of these sides, right? So of course, like this is not gonna be true. And then there, instead of there, instead of um, um, instead of like the segment that was there, I'm gonna put two copies of the same segment in the shape of a triangle. So something like. See? Okay. Make sense? All right. So now I'm gonna do it again. And I'm gonna do this here, do this here, do this here. And I'm gonna save you some time. And if I do that, this is what happens. Okay. And now the point is that where the reality detaches a little bit from mathematics, but not too much. Um, is that um, you continue doing this infinitely many times, okay? And then the object that you get at the end is called, called snowflake. And now the question is like, if I try, so now I, I wanna measure the perimeter, right? So kind of like if I were to measure this thing here, so like the old, and if I do it, I can keep going and do it and do it and do it, and you'll figure out that it's always gonna be infinity. And that's very disappointing because this is not an infinitely long line. I can like, I can draw a fairly decent approximation on my whiteboard. So this doesn't make sense, it's infinity. And the problem here is that I'm asking the wrong question because this, the, the boundary, the perimeter of this object does not have dimension one, but it also doesn't have dimension two. It doesn't have any area. And in fact, this number here, is its dimension. Now, of course, this, I mean, the first time you hear about this, maybe like this is a pretty popular, this is like a pretty math pop stuff. So you, many of you probably heard about that, but if it, maybe it's the first time, you might be, you might be surprised and this kind of that doesn't make any sense for you. And this requires like behind that, there is like a lot of math. You have to define because like what is length, what is, like what is like being one dimensional, two dimensional, three dimensional. Those are called, that, that's a dimension as someone put it out early. And now this one is a new concept of dimension. It's called Hausdorff dimension. I will, you don't, I mean, just in case you wanna Google it, I can spell it for you later if you like. And, um, and then each dimension come with some measure. So once I know which, so to understand the size of, of an object, I need to understand First of all, which dimension it is in? Because I don't wanna compare cubes with squares. I don't wanna compare squares with segments. And once I understand that, I, wanna, I also wanna learn how to distinguish between a tiny square and a big square, right? And that's the concept of measure. So there are two stages in trying to understand the, 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 the size of an object. So, uh, it's like first understanding which is the right dimension and then understanding which one is the right, um, which one is its measure. But we can only learn how to measure something once after we have, we have figured out this dimension. And that's why 
I cannot measure this with a lens because that's the wrong, that's the wrong uh, the dimension. Since uh, just for like com completeness, I just drew a couple of different examples. So these are like typical fractals. So they're very like, these are fractal objects. So they're called like, um, they are self-similar. So at each stage, I'm just copying the same construction as before inside my, my previous step. And these are just objects which are, because of their very symmetric properties, for us in math, it is very easy to compute their dimension. And that's why when talking about dimension, these are this example that you often hear about. But these are not the only one. For instance, a few people, and this is on Wikipedia, so I like, I encourage you after the talk, I mean, ideally not during the talk, but you know, you're at your own computer, you can do whatever you want, uh, to Google fractal dimension. And some people have measured fractal, dim fractal dimension of coastlines. Because you know, coastlines are very convoluted. And so, so, so something. So, but like for simplicity, we just do these ones. And, uh, and in real life, uh, in, in it, like fractal objects appear Often in real, like in real life, of course, the real life course approximation of that. And one, for instance, is um, the er er Romanesco broccoli, which is also each each part of it looks like the whole broccoli thing. So also, yeah. So it's it's not as common here as as in Rome, but uh, but like I'm sure that will be of similar. Okay, so second example. Let me see what time. Okay, perfect. Second example. Now I start. Now I'm gonna. So here I was doing like my my original intuition was to compute the, the length of this, right? Because it was a perimeter or something. Now let's try and see something which happens with the area. So now instead of like adding length, I'm gonna remove pieces of the picture. So I started with the imagine that this triangle is all colored black, but just like for laziness I didn't color it and now I want to remove I'm going to pick the middle of each of the three sides one two three all right and I'm going to draw the triangle here and now this one I remove it I trash it I throw it out okay and now I do the same it's a self similar construction so now I put another I, I take another triangle here and I mean, you got the drill, and then I throw this out. And I continue infinitely many times. The resulting object is called the Sierpinski gasket or triangle. This has a many interesting properties that I don't have time to tell you, but it's kind of fun. Um, maybe, okay. And, um, and now the question, the natural answer that you would ask is like, what's the area? Right, because maybe okay, the area at the beginning was like base time height divided by two as the area of a triangle, and then you can like compute that. And then if you do that, at the end, you will always find it zero. And then again, you can try to compute this length, but guess what? You will always find it's infinity. So, what is happening is that in fact, this has dimension 1.58, so it's a little more, it's a little. It's a little more towards being like a two dimensional thing, while this one is a little more closer to be a one dimensional thing, which should make like you should feel like happy about it. You should be like, oh yeah, mm, kind of makes sense. So, okay. And then there is another example, and it is called the four corner counter set. It or like every object in mathematics, everybody, every country has its own name. So I'm sure this has come with like the other seven names. But yeah, so what happens here? Now I have a square and the side length of my square is one something. And now I took like, I, I look at the, I cut the all sides in four. Four, 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 four. You go, okay. I'm not very good at this, okay? And now in the four corners, hence the name, I drew other four square and I throw out everything else. This is a third, okay. Okay? So now this guy is the is the guy who's so 
something that you should like, this is, I'm just trying to give you an idea without using any math of how to compute this, like what this dimension works. Because I can define, I can make a, a definition where the dimension of this is square root pi over three e log, you know, like, and that's the definition and maybe it works, but like, so here I'm doing construction similar to this one, but you can see that I'm removing a lot more stuff. So you, you expect this to be smaller in dimension because at every stage here, I only removed a quarter of the area, right? Because it was like four identical triangle, but here I'm removing a lot more. And then if you continue doing this, and I'm not gonna draw it because, because I cannot, I have my chair here, so I cannot reach there. And uh, um, uh, if you do it, you'll find out this is dimension one. So it actually, although it doesn't look like a line in any possible ways, this is like a line. This is the same dimension as a line. Okay, but then at the end, it's gonna be a dust. These are like, uh, this, this, these are called also contour dust. Because at the end, you'd only see like little tiny dots but it's still, and it looks like, oh, that's probably like, it's like a point, it doesn't have a dimension. No, it actually, if you put many, it has dimension one. So, um, okay, I think. Um, so, okay, so this was just like, uh, we, 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 this was, we came out with two different properties that objects can have, which is a size and a shape. And this is all I have to tell you for today about size. So unless there are any questions right now, which I would be happy to answer, we can go back to this later, but I'm gonna have to erase that. So, because on the other side, there is my Zoom schedule, so I can't lose that. So, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to, to erase this. Okay, so now we understand that uh, studying the size of an object is not as easy as one can naively think. Now let's think about shape. Like I asked someone before, what's the property of my glass? And you told me that it was a cylinder, which is like, because we, through this uh, zoom and video camera, we can project a pretty good three-dimensional image, right? So if you see a cylinder in living in three dimensions, you say like, oh, that's a cylinder. So let's try to, um, okay. I'm, I spent a long time on this. It's a little sad, but it's okay. Anyway, if later we have to talk about them, we can just Google them. There is like infinitely many, much better pictures of them on the internet. Okay, so now, side, uh, shape. How can I tell the shape of these things? Here, I was never really concerned about the shape, right? I only cared how long they were, what dimension they were in. So let's think about like this cylinder that was mentioned earlier. And imagine we are playing a game now. And the game is like, is that I tell, I tell you the, um, I can only, I can tell you the sh only the shadows that an, a certain object cast, and you have to guess what object it is. So I'm gonna start shining a, a, a flashlight from, from, from the top, and the shadow I will see here is gonna be a circle. Now at this stage, I could, if this was like we were playing a game, I could ask you, I have an object in my hand, and when I cast a shadow from the top, it's a circle. Can you tell me what it is? No, you could say it's a cylinder, it's a sphere, it's something really messed up, which, I mean, it is, a, it is my lamp over there, which has a circular base. It is, you know, could be pretty much anything. So you need more information, right? Well, so maybe I could like start telling you more. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. Red was the light. It's uh, so coherent. Okay. Well, so maybe I then I start telling you more information. It's like, okay, so now I shine light on the object from the left. So now what do I see here? Well, I see. I see a rectangle. So now maybe you could still get cylinder, but there is still a ton of directions. So like, I mean, naively, you can say there is one more that, <clears throat> one more that it, it, a direction that I need to, to take, which is this one coming out for the whiteboard. But in fact, there is infinitely many because 
if I mean a cylinder is a very symmetric object. So even if I if I shine my light anywhere in these directions, I always see a rectangle, right? And but in general, objects are, can be way more complicated than that. And so maybe if every little change casts a different shadow, right? So that's uh, that's something like okay. So now when I wanna because imagine the light sometimes if you wanna study the if so if you wanna study the the shape of an object, maybe all you have access to is its shadows, which in mathematics we call the projections. That's like the mathematical term for shadows. So like, and so maybe sometimes you can only study the shadow of an object and you have to figure out what the object is. And now the question is, is that even possible? Like once I have the object in my hand, as long as I have a flashlight, I can study all the, all, the, all of the shadow. So given the object, I can, I can guess all of the shadow. But now the question at some point it was, what about like the opposite? If I know, a lot of shadows, can I like reconstruct what object did I have? And this, I don't know, like, I actually have no idea how like this, how complicated this sounds, but this was like fairly complicated. And so, um, and the answer, it is yes. And this is a, so it, this is a theorem, it's a theorem by, by Kenneth Falconer, it's an American mathematician. I think I, I forgot to look up the date. I'm sorry, uh, but I, I I told Pamela that I, I wanted to send you like a little like uh, read, a li a, like two page reading afterwards. So there you find all the info, and um, which says yes, if you have many, many many shadows, and where many 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 is quantified in a mathematical sense, which I would not bore you with then you can actually construct the object, okay? And now like, and, and now, and so this is like something which like, it looks very simple, but it's like, if you try to think about very complicated objects, then like something like a sculpture. Like it's, imagine like you have a sculpture in your house and you cast all the shadows. You cannot tell what's, what the object was. And so this was like somehow like, a, a little counterintuitive even. And, um, and that, and now here is the, we're coming to the end, which is like, okay, so something that works with shadow is our is sundials. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with sundials. So the first, actually, so, yeah, so the first sundial is just a stick in the ground and the length of the shadow of the stick will tell you what time of the day it is, then later, uh, I guess Greek and Romans introduced the sundial, which has like an hemi hemispherical plate at the bottom, right? And they like the angle of the shadow. Of course, this is a bad thing. To, it's a bad way. It's a, not a bad way. It's like, it's not a great, once we have clocks, it's not a, gra a great way to measure time because hours have different length in summer and winter. Depending on where you live, hours have different length if you use the sun. So of course it's not ideal. And this is actually like, so the one I say, it's not like, um, sundials are not very used anymore. So this is not like, so I wanted to show a, a, like a, an application of geometric measure theory, which is, I think it's amazing, although fairly useless, which is like, and this is like the digital sundial that like, okay, so this is a digital sundial and this is what it was in the title. Okay, so let's try to figure out what this is. So this is, this is a modern 3D printed version that I bought on eBay. So you can all buy for like 10 bucks. And, uh, but there are nicer ones. And so the first sundials were constructed um, using the proof of Falconer theorem, which in mathematics is some, like, something that makes me very happy. You're probably indifferent to it, but you can like rejoin with me at least. And, uh, and that's because, and so what is the principle of it? And, so imagine that you have, oh, well, okay, Venetian blinds, right? So I have Venetian blinds and I can just do this and rotate the thing, depending on how much light I want to come in the, I want to come in my house or not, right? So the, the sundial was built on this principle. 
So let me draw you I, just one last picture. And then since today is cloudy, I took a video of the sundial yesterday for you. Uh, so, right, so if, imagine like I'm building a weird Venetian blind. So I start with like a, a solid panel and then I wanna like, I want the light to enter only when the sun is at, uh, at a certain angle. And so then I'm gonna construct. I'm gonna chop it in three pieces and I'm gonna, these are gonna be the three, the three, I don't know how you call them, or the Venetian blind. And then, but maybe I also want some other light to come in when I look at the other side. And so what do I do? Well, I just like, I'm really bad at drawing, so forgive me. Uh, I just like, I cut each of them in three more pieces. So now this is a, oh, sorry. So now the light comes in, in this direction and in this direction. So, I mean, I'll send you a thing which has a much better picture of this. But the idea is that the way that like, how does this sundial, how can I build a, a digital sundial? I just have to like carefully choose all the angles so that at the end, things cut the shadow I want. And the, what is the shadow I want? The digits. Like something that looks like this. Okay, so this is, I'm, I'm claiming that this object, when I shine the sun on it, casts a shadow that looks like 10 o'clock, but in a digital sense. Is this helpful to humanity? Maybe not, but it's very cool. So I think it's worth knowing about. And um, um, what did I wanna say? I wanna say something. Uh, oh yeah, and there's also actually that um, a very like a cute fact, which uh, is that like, uh, I don't know. So in, I, in the houses where I live, I always had horizontal um, Venetian blind. But every off, in the office I've ever, many, in my office during my grass, during, during, during grass school, I had Venetian, uh, vertical Venetian blinds. And is there a difference? Well, it depends where you live. If you live like in the north and like closer to the northern hemisphere, you like the sun, does a biggest path from left to right than it does from bottom to top. Of course, if you're at the equator, that's not true, right? But, and so the point is that horizontal blind are better because the sun, I mean, are better meaning that I don't have to adjust them every five seconds because the sun is pretty much always like, it doesn't change that much. While vertical blind in this scenario, uh, the sun is gonna move a lot. And so every time, it doesn't matter how much I, I twist them, it's gonna shine some light through. So I'm gonna have to like replace, I mean, reposition my, my Venetian blind many times. And let me, so this, I'm sorry if this last bit was confusing. I, but don't worry because there is a, it's actually an article on Scientific American, which is the image of the, of the digital sundial in the announcement was taken from. And I asked Pamela to share it. I mean, I'll send it to her and I'll share it with you. It's just two pages and it's not technical. And I found it's very like, it's very nice and, and explained this like Venetian blind concept better than me. So, but in the meantime, like before that, let me give you, I mean, I like so far you, this is only like, you're just trusting me that this works, right? So let me, let me do this. Um, you should see my screen. No? It oh. hasn't okay. come up yet. There we go. How about now? It works? Can you see yeah, it? Up. Very well. So I took this yesterday. Oh, cool. Because it was Sunday. And like, I mean, if I'm moving you with my hand because I didn't, I didn't want to take a seven hour video. Mm -hmm. But you can see the like, how the digit chain, I think I only, I took many. So this, I mean, these are the best ones. So I'll let you imagine the other ones. And so this one, you can tell, for instance, from this short video that um, this has a, of course, the more complicated, 
how, how do we divide the time? We divide it in hours, we divide it in minutes, we divide it in seconds and whatever. The more complicated the object is, but then in real life, we have a, an issue with the material to actually build it, the more fine you can measure time. If you look at this one, you can see that uh, it goes in intervals of 20 minutes. 14, 14, 20, 14, 40, 15, right? So, yeah, anyway, so you can purchase like much, this, this is kind of ugly. You can purchase like slightly more expensive, but they're actually not absurd. And also made for your location because, um, sorry, let me, all right. Uh, and, and also made for your location because of course the sun hits the earth at a different angle depending on when you are in the summer, in the winter, in the, so they're like custom made for your location and you can change with the, this, the, this one is cheap with like a, a base that allows you to change the angle. And I don't know, I think it's a good idea. I tried to convince IES to buy one. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I think that's uh, that's all. I think I'm on. Sylvia, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, questions, anyone? And thank you for letting me know about the sundial and IAS. You, we'll have to talk about that online, <laughs> that request. Can I ask a question? Please. Uh, back, the thing you erased, the four corner a uh, counter set, dimension one? Yeah. What is, what is the length of that set? One. The length is one? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, and one way, I mean, uh, okay, let me actually like, I mean, I cannot explain you why it's really one, but I can, uh, I can convince you that it has some length, right? So let me draw it again. I'll try to be, Oh, that's pretty good square. Okay, so let's say like, sorry, like one way to like show that like it does have length because a priori could be like zero and it could be like very small, right? One way to like see that you keep going and you have to find there is like some little trickery here in finding the right angle. But if I put a line here, and I cast the shadow of the object, so I project it, like you can see the like, I mean, and of course it's gonna be like a lot of smaller things, but, but because I put a shadow where like the squares are not, they don't overlap. I wanna find the right shadow so that things don't overlap, which is, um, which is not 45, right? Because 45, this guy and this guy overlap. And you can like do it and you can figure out that the shadow of this fills up a lot of that, which is, I mean, and the, actually, so, yeah. So maybe it's a little bigger than one. It could be square root of two. So don't quote me on that. <laughs> because uh, the, the length of this one, this length is square root of two. Because it's the diagonal yeah. of the square. So, but I don't, okay. But anyway, but I'm not sure. I think uh, I'm, I'm still convinced as well. It could be one, but that, 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 that's not, in, to me, that's not important. The fact that it's like a, a big number is the, is the thing. And that's, I think, one way. And since we also talked about shadows and projection, that's one way to see. Like another way to measure, actually, thank you for that great question. Another way to measure things is that I cannot measure it. Well, let me cast a shadow. If its shadow is big, then I got to come for something that is like big, otherwise, if something has too many holes, they will cast almost no shadow. So that's another way that then people can measure. You can use, once you know the shape, you have a much better chance of getting to measure things right. Hope that helps, I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? Sylvia, can I ask a question about, um, um, working together and, and, and how the, the, um, the collaboration and work in the School of Mathematics is, has been going since, um, since you have been off campus? 
off I mean, we can't well, escape you're that. You're on campus, but not in your office. Can't escape, yeah. Right. But yeah, so uh, I think it, I mean, the School of Mathematics is divided in group. So there is like, a, and there is a, okay, maybe, maybe this is boring for many of you, but I don't know. So like at, at different schools at IES have different structures. In the School of Mathematics, there is a lot of people in my position, so like, uh, uh, we are, which are doing a postdoc. So we don't have a permanent position. We are like younger in an academic sense, at least. And uh, we all have an official mentor assigned, which is either a faculty, but there are only six faculty uh, in the School of Mathematics. So it, it could be one of the visiting faculty as well, which there are a handful of every year. And then there is also people mid-career, which are more independent. And so the people, at least my mentor, I know that like different mentors have been doing different things. We have learning seminars every week. So we talk and then we, we also have um, um, just coffee like uh, on Zoom every week. And then we like read research papers and talk with them about them, themselves and uh, many like collaboration and stuff are still going with like even with collaborators which are like also external to the IES. And seminar, I think, I believe that right now all of School of Mathematics seminars are running. They all, I mean, I don't know about other, but like we, all the seminars are all running, including mean, Mathematical Conversation was the trickiest one to, uh, to change on Zoom because uh, it is like, well, many of you probably have attended it, after hours conversation in the past, at least one, at least those which are like nearby. It's a very informal, like people are drinking, eating and chatting. And so that's can be very hard to like transform in Zoom. But, and the School of Math has been very, I mean, this was, uh, I mean, the School of Math has been very helpful in that. For instance, this was like, this is one of the things that the School of Math purchased for some of us to help communication via Zoom. So, yeah. And I mean, I actually, so let me see if I can do that. So I, I think I can tell you, I think this is like, maybe I am worse than other, but I think this can tell you the like classical Zoom schedule of a mathematician these days. Oh my <laughs> God. Yoga. Some of it is yoga, I know. But like, <laughs> this can tell you like that uh, people are actually often very busy, even busier than, than other stuff. And these are like, there is again lots of yoga because mental mental health is very important too. But a lot of them are like meetings with peers or with uh, mentors or seminars, either yes or otherwise. So, yeah. Thank you. Yes, uh, I have a question. So with the um, the canter, uh, whatever you call that, <laughs> the canter, you're saying that there's there's a way to shine the shadow such that the points left over will form a complete line, like exactly fall in the line, no overlap, no gaps, correct? Yeah. So that means with the triangle one, there's no way to shine a shadow where there isn't overlap. Is that basically how you think about it? Yes. The triangle sieve. Yeah, so, uh, or, uh, or maybe like uh, the problem, yeah, so like the point is that like, this is just like a, I just picked the line with the, with, with, with the triangle wall, that's, that is chubbier. The triangle one is chubbier. So with the, sh with the shadow, all we can obtain. So, okay, in mathematics, a general principle is that I wanna find something. And the first step that you do is, can I say whether something, what is something uh, bigger than and less than? And this is called a lower bound and an upper bound. That's a generic principle of mathematics. Sometimes it's very hard to find the exact value of something, but it could be very easy and, as valuable to find like, all right, I have no idea what this quantity is, but it's bigger than one and less than 15. And maybe that, that's good enough for many mathematicians. And by, by casting a shadow, I can only find the lower bound. I can tell you, well, it's shadow is long one, so definitely is longer than one. So the problem is that like the intersect, we don't see the intersect, like you're saying, right? They, when they overlap, we don't really know that. But yes, yeah, so gotcha. it's chubbier and you can't really do that. But gotcha. there's a square version of Sierpinski gasket, which is called Sierpinski carpet. And uh, yeah, and I mean, actually, we, we, if you look at fractal dimension, Wikipedia, I think, has a very nice table 
with several different objects that you can look at and read about and their dimension, which include coastlines and other. And uh, so that, that, that's very, it's very nice. I, I'm, I hope I address your question. Stacy, did, did you need any um, additional, do you have any follow up on that or no? No, that, that's great. That, that answered my question perfectly. So it's just one of the bounds. Thanks. <laughs> great, thank you. Sylvia, are there any, what are the practical um, applications for other than you mentioned coastlines, anything like planets, yeah. like anything else? So, do you remember your theory, like so a lot about it, like, I mean, I just told you like a very vague thing. So for instance, geometric measure theory comes up uh, in uh, minimization problems a lot. So like uh, maybe you've heard the story before, like Dido, uh, uh, one of like, a, I think it's called the Dido problem or the Dido something. Um, um, she like, imagine that I give you I tell you, okay, I'll give you enough money to buy one mile of fencing, okay? And now it's your choice. Like you can choose the shape of your fence. But of course you wanna like, maybe that the fence is like, uh, everything inside the fence becomes yours. And that's where like your animal can go past you or whatever. So what is your goal? Your goal is to maximize the area, which is constrained by a given perimeter. And the answer, does anybody know or wants to guess what's the answer? What shape is the answer? A mile of fence? If I give you like a certain perimeter and I tell you, okay, now you can like build a thing like however you like, but you, your goal is to get the most land. Circle. Yes, it's a circle. <laughs> you should put your fence in a circle. Wow to maximize your, the, the grass inside. And so for instance, geometric measure theory comes into play like sim, uh, in studying stuff like that, which you can imagine like, so it's like, uh, so like minim, minim, you can also like phrase it like in maximi maximizing, minimizing. And so then there is like a more uh, fields of applied mathematics that do optimization. And then there is uh, something which I, I don't know anything about because I've always do pure mathematics, not really application. There is like a lot of natural phenomena are described by PDE, which means partial differential equations. So just the way that things evolve. So like the way that heat diffuse, the way that fluids, the water moves, or the way like almost every physical phenomena can be described by that. And often techniques of this tool are helpful in studying the properties of, 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 of these other things. And another thing is that in uh, this more recent, uh, in, um, now that we are in a world of data, data can be a geometrical, geometrically a monster, depending on like where you plot, like how you plot data can be really bad. And often like you wanna try to figure out maybe some like geometric condition or like whether you can fit it to some, you, you wanna fit it to a, to a function or um, maybe like, your, your data has a dimension which is too high. And so you wanna use what is like so-called dimension reduction. And uh, these type of things, like they're different. I mean, uh, apply mathematics and apply to the real world, which and there is some like profound difference in the pure math and the other thing, but like the ideas are often the same. So there are application also in, I guess, data analysis, which is called dimension reduction and, and many other. Thank you. Once again, I don't know anything about. So if any of you knows more than than me, don't <laughs> sorry if I said anything wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Sylvia, are you at the institute for a one-year membership? Yeah. Yes, I'm leaving. Uh, I'm gonna try to leave in July. <laughs> Yes, I am. Uh, I'm going. I have a, a postdoc, so like a three-year position on the University of Washington in Seattle. So, so if, um, if, I, if you look back at your year and COVID's interruption of that, have you been able to achieve what you had hoped to achieve? Uh, how much has it changed that process? 
Okay, so I think um, I, I did not come here with like a project that I wanted to finish, like many others do. And I think this depends on the stage of my career. So I arrived here right after graduating from a PhD. And I think it's like, a, 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 that's a pretty um, uh, inexperienced researcher mind. So I didn't have like, you know, uh, a lot of people come here, especially in, uh, in social science and historical studies, they come here a little um, older. Like I, older, I always mean uh, uh, in an academic sense. Um, and that normally one already has a, a pretty more like shaped idea of the research and what they want to do. So I definitely, I mean, for me coming here meant having a new mentor and meant having more time because uh, we, all, I, we, we, we always teach during our PhD and during our postdocs. We, teaching is a big part of being a mathematician. And um, so I definitely learned a lot from like, uh, uh, from, from my mentor and just like with my mentor. And uh, so, I, again, I, it's hard to, for me to pinpoint whether I accomplished a goal because I didn't have like, you know, I want to write this paper. I'm still trying to figure out my way and figure out what I really want to do and, and do in math. And physicists, physicists come here at the same stage I come, but they stay for three or four years. So one year in mathematical, mathematics is a very short time to to say some, I want to do this because sometimes things work out and you can write a paper in two weeks. Sometimes things don't work out and you write a paper in 12 years. And neither of them is worse than, than the other. It's just a lie. We don't have any data to collect. And to, to theoretical, the school of physics works in a similar way because it's all theoretical physics there. So I, I, I guess besides the system biology part, but it's like you, it either like a, the proofs of theorem, they either work or not work, and it's very hard to predict. When you are more experienced, the other good thing that you get is that you have a better idea of when something is gonna work or not. Like, I guess this works in every field of life. So, so yeah. And COVID, COVID has personally has been, I live alone, and that has been really hard for me. So definitely COVID has a huge negative impact on my research. And, uh, meaning that like I cannot focus. I like and like uh, I'm just not at the like uh, happy in a happy spot enough to do proficient work. And in fact, actually, but this is a, seems to be a phenomenon which happens pretty much around the world. And actually, I was reading, and again, I'm like everybody is welcome to email me. My email is like on the inter like on, on the IES everywhere. Uh, a study about uh, which I mean I have I live alone I have no family I have no children so there's definitely there's something which like uh, on a theoretical sense will give me more favor that um, uh, in, a, in mathematics uh, journals and so we post what's a way that you measure the productivity of a mathematician you me you measure how many papers are they submitting and women have been submitting less than fifty percent than usual since COVID started. Mm -hmm. While the numbers for men have not decreased, if not increased. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure what, like, I mean, a lot of that is housework and children. And so, but like, that's just like data. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a, a good model to fit to my data, to this data. So I don't know. I know others which have been very productive here at IES specifically, and others which have been not productive at all. I don't know. Maybe I ask. I I ask like I answer your question like in every possible interpretation. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't like. <laughs> that, that was very helpful. Thank you for okay. all the different dimensions. <laughs> Sally, were you asking a question? I'm sorry. You're Sally. muted. Question, do you find that architects want to work with mathematicians when they're trying to design buildings that make a lot of use in light and shadow? Uh, are you familiar with the, I mean, I don't know about shadow. I mean, I would, if you are an architect, I would think that's a cool idea. 
I'm not <laughs> sure of uh, of things, but like uh, I, I, like the first thing that comes to mind when mentioning architecture and like shapes is a uh, Gaudi. Yes, uh, a, a Catalan too. a Catalan architect. Yeah, yeah. So he used the he used the he didn't use the pumps of, like shadow that much, but he used catenary. Uh huh. Like yes. His arches look like if I if I put a chain and I like lock it here and then I I, I let it dangle. Yes. The arch look like this, but upside down. For for no. those for the others who maybe don't know, are not familiar with we we go with this. But I, I'm not sure. I mean. I'm sure someone uh, has thought about something like that, most of all, because maybe you don't, uh, a lot of the shape already exists, so you don't need like a, a research necessarily. Like you can just, you know, look up the shape and like, oh, this cast a full, a full shadow. But um, I, I'm not, I, I don't know of any of this instance, but I would imagine them existing. I have seen uh, from the Southwest Native American culture of the Pueblos, that they had carved uh, calendars that were both solar and lunar on the same circular design up in the mountains. And the shadow was the stick. I mean, as the shadow moved across the uh, spiral design, you could measure the seasons. And uh, also, it was a lunar calendar. Oh, wow. OK. So yeah. very nice. Very interesting. Thank you. And thank you. I uh, I can't grapple with all of the concepts you introduced, but the Venetian blinds. Okay. I can follow up. So on. yeah. So the, this article, uh, you know, I'm like, uh, I'm not doing, I'm not being a good academic because I should cite my references. So Ian Stewart um, is the person who wrote this article in the Scientific American in the '90s. I want to say, yeah, in '91. And it's trippy, and that's the, the and I will I will ask Pamela to send an email to all of you with the yeah. link to the article, which is like I think it's not beyond it's not behind the paywall, no. I think. So or I mean I'll send it to you. Yeah. And um and uh and yeah, so that, that part is the is explained well. I try my best to like take away all the mathematics, <laughs> but it's uh it's not too like I hope I, 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 I did a, a house decent job at that. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Yes, and when I send around the Scientific American article, I'll include your email address if you don't mind. And then anyone who would like to get in touch with Sylvia um, directly, please do. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I'd like to thank you so much for taking the time to spend with the friends and helping us to kick off our um, virtual series of talks. Uh, we'll meet again next Friday uh, for those who are interested. Um, and School of Social Science member Evan Kirksey is going to be discussing gene therapy, innovation, and inequality. Um, so thank you all for coming. And we look forward to hearing from you. Please keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.